and we are live in our website. I'll pass now the floor to the moderator so he can start with the webinar. Thank you very much. Please, Mr. Shimada, whenever you are ready, go ahead with the workshop. Thank you very much. And uh, hello, everybody. And I would like to uh, welcome to the panel discussion on the theme of the nuclear disarmament and our sustainable future. Uh, first of all, I would like to uh, say thank you to the UNITAR and the UNDESA and the others related to this event uh, to invite us and giving us the opportunity uh, to uh, present uh, our opinions. Uh, my name is Kunihiko Shimada. I'm the uh, principal director for the Hiroshima Organization for Global Peace, Global Peace and uh, I'm the moderator for the, today's session. Before getting into the uh, actual panel discussion, I would like to have the welcome remark by the uh, governor of the Hiroshima prefecture, and he's also the president of the HOPE, um, the governor Hidehiko Yuzaki. Greetings to everyone participating in this session. I'd like to thank you for your interest in and joining this event. I'm Hidehiko Yuzaki, governor of Hiroshima prefecture and the president of Hiroshima Organization for Global Peace, or HOPE, for short. Allow me to begin by expressing my sincere gratitude to everyone at the Division for Sustainable Development Goals in the United Nations Department of Economic and Social Affairs and the United Nations Institute for Training and Research for providing the Hiroshima prefectural government and hope with the opportunity to organize one of the special sessions of the High Level Political Forum 2021 which is drawing considerable global attention. The 2020 was a remarkably difficult year for everyone with the explosive spread of COVID-19, bringing everyday life to a screeching halt, the effects still continuing to this day. What can we take away from this public health crisis? We are living through a global pandemic of an infectious disease this is beyond belief that wouldn't happen in real life, although some specialists previously have alerted us to the health crisis. Unfortunately, the pandemic is very real and it is seriously hindering the achievement of the SDGs. Given the experience of the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic, what do we need if we are to develop a sustainable and resilient global community. Let me share with you the three points that I think we need to consider. First, it's important to look past issues that have already occurred and take a renewed look at the potential threats, risks, and the vulnerabilities, viewing them as a commonplace problems. Let me give you an example. Amidst the dis disturbances caused by COVID-19, we have witnessed numerous latent social issues rise to the surface. They range from racial discrimination, disparities, and healthcare issues. Thus, for us to protect people's lives, livelihoods, and dignity, it is vital that we take action to avert and reduce risks of a potential crisis. The second point is the importance of perceiving one issue from many different angles in terms of how it relates to a variety of fields. Any social crisis in one field is almost always deeply connected to other fields and vice versa. The hardships associated with COVID-19 lockdowns have been felt more acutely by the poor, single parents, and other socially vulnerable groups. There are various theories on the origin of COVID-19. Some believe that it started with people coming in contact with bats, 
a direct result of the expansion of human's sphere of activities. If so, we can say that it was a consequence of environmental destruction. One can also argue that COVID-19 spread like wildfire throughout the world because everything moves across national borders in this age of globalization. The third point is the wise use of resources. In this day and age, we face many urgent challenges such as pandemics like COVID-19 and global catastrophes caused by environmental devastation. We need to demonstrate more wisdom and thoughtfulness when determining where best to allocate limited resources so that humankind can work in concert to properly address these shared challenges and achieve a sustainable and resilient recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic. The same is true for nuclear weapons, whose abolition we have long worked toward. Once used, nuclear weapons leave a massive scar, and it is no exaggeration to say that they're the prime example of latent threats, risks, and vulnerabilities. We can easily imagine that even a single nuclear explosion, be it by an intentional attack or an unforeseen accident, can ruin all chances of achieving any development goals. According to a report by the International Committee of the Red Cross, the use of nuclear weapons would have devastating impacts on our society and economy, as they completely rule out the possibility of extending aid to the victims of the destruction they cause. Furthermore, many scientists have also pointed to the irreparable damage they inflict on the environment. In the worst case, that could annihilate all lives on the earth, including us, human beings. If we begin to allocate our limited resources more carefully on an as-needed basis while promoting nuclear disarmament by reappropriating military spending on nuclear weapons to causes such as social development, including poverty reduction and recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic, I believe we can make the global community far more sustainable and resilient. The trajectory of the future will be completely different for us and the gen generation that follow depending on the choice we make between a world with or without nuclear weapons. With this in mind, the Hiroshima Prefecture government and the HOPE published the Hiroshima Initiative outline earlier this year to call for global action in an attempt to build a consensus among all the UN member states on including the abolition of nuclear weapons in the global goals set for the UN's 100th anniversary. To make this happen, we must deepen discussions on how the environment, society, economy, and other topics in the field of development relate to the issue of nuclear weapons. In line with the theme of the high-level political forum special session, namely sustainable and resilient recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic that promotes the economic, social, and the environmental dimensions of sustainable development, we have chosen nuclear disarmament under a sustainable future as the theme for session 10. Today, we are pleased to have representatives of a youth group and leading specialists in the nuclear disarmament, the SDGs, and the environment and the human rights serving as our panelists. I expect them to have profound discussion on how the issue of nuclear weapons fits into the SDGs as they contribute knowledge from their respective fields and present concrete images of a world with and without nuclear weapons, bearing in mind the connections between the COVID-19 pandemic and the issue of nuclear weapons. I look forward to lively discussions by the panelists. This concludes my remarks. And now back to the moderator.
Mr. Shimada, over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Governor uh, Yuzaki. And uh, now look, we would like to uh, turn to the opening session. But before doing that, uh, I would like to make some announcements. As uh, some of you already done, uh, if you have any kind of greetings and general comments, please use the chat box uh, on the Zoom. But the, if you have the specific questions to ask the panelists, uh, please use the Q&A session next to the chat box. And so that we can uh, have, uh, we can just, you know, the, the take uh, your questions and uh, hopefully we can just answer uh, in or during our deliberations. Now, please allow me to uh, introduce, briefly introduce the, uh, the institution which I'm also serving as a principal director, it's a HOPE. And uh, and then afterwards, I would like to just raise some like a discussion points for the panelists. So hope uh, I can manage to share my screen well. Aha, uh -huh. this is it. Yeah, and hope I can do that like this. Hi. Uh, the HOPE, the Hiroshima Organization for Global Peace, is just established in April 2021. However, uh, it's established based on the 20 plus years of accumulated work, such as the Human Resource Development Like a Future Leaders Program for Global Peace, Hiroshima Icon Academy, and uh, for the, the dialogue events such as the UN 75 in Hiroshima, and Hiroshima Business Forum for Global Peace. And also, we also have the uh, research and policy making, including the Hiroshima Report, which is the latest one, the 2021 version. And as you see that from the picture, the governor, uh, Yuzaki, in the past, uh, he also participated in the MPT review conference in the past. So this is the, the, the very quick uh, introduction. And here, Hiroshima Organization for Global Peace, HOPE, uh, was established uh, with the, some of the goals, but actually one of the largest goal is to, uh, goal number one is to include the abolition of nuclear weapons in the post-2030 agenda under the SDGs negotiation. Means that we will try to find the bridge between the sustainable development issues also, uh, and, and also the nuclear disarmament uh, issues. So the hope, set up the working group of experts in order to clarify the interconnectedness a bridge between the uh, sustainable development and nuclear disarmament in the future. So let's say we'll just uh, name it as a nuclear free future group. This is still tentative, but the, the, our aim to include the abolition of nuclear weapons in the post 2030 agenda, as I mentioned. And I uh, hope we'd like to propose a formation of the nuclear free group, which is a tentative name. So if you have a better idea, please let us know. That will serve as a platform to for civil society to join the UN post SDGs negotiations process. So uh, there are the few goals among the many goals, including the current one, the 17, 17 goals, but the, the, for the post 2030 agenda, we would like to see something related to the abolition of nuclear weapons appear as one of the goals we are aiming for for the future. And uh, if you're interested in, please join a nuclear free group and uh, the aims and specific names, as I mentioned, to formulate the policy proposals focus on the linkages between the abolition of nuclear weapons and sustainable development, and also to obtain the UN consultative status as a special issue group and participate in the post SDGs negotiation processes. So if you're interested in join us and also if you can just work with us to for the uh, common future goals, please sign up using the Google survey address below, which is also provided in this form. And hopefully like uh, the, my colleagues that would put it on the comment page as well. So uh, this concludes the uh, brief introduction of the Hiroshima Organization for Global Peace. In, in short, it's a hope.
And now I would like to, before going into the panel discussion, I would like to raise the three, introduce the three discussion points, which uh, we, the hope, asks the each presenters and panelists to address upon. First one is the commonalities between COVID-19 pandemic and the issues of nuclear weapons. This is actually one of the key themes during this 2021 high level uh, policy forum. And the second one is the interconnectedness of the issues of nuclear weapons and the sustainable development goals, uh, especially like uh, for the kind of a uh, vision uh, for the post 2030 world. And third one, and I would like you to address on the issues of the envisioning a nuclear free world. What kind of world are you dreaming of? What kind of like a, the, the world uh, you are like looking at for the future where we don't have any nuclear uh, weapons uh, in our daily lives? So with that, uh, now I would like to turn to this session one, which is a panelist presentation. So each panelist has uh, upper, upper approximately like a five minutes each uh, to uh, do the self brief self introduction, and uh, I would like each presenters and panelists uh, to address the three uh, discussion points uh, in their presentations. So now I would like to uh, give the floor to Mr. Nikhil Lasseth. Uh, he's the uh, Assistant Secretary General of the United Nations, and he's the head of the a unitar, uh, one of the organizers of this session. So, Mr. Steph, you have the floor, sir. But hold on a second. Thank Let you. Me close it. Yes. Thank yeah. you, Shimada San, for giving me the floor. And uh, thank you for inviting me to the high level political forum session 10 on the theme of nuclear disarmament and our sustainable future. I am the executive director of Unitar. And at Unitar, we believe that it's only by training and behavioral change that training leads to that we can achieve many of the sustainable development goals. Let me also start by commenting on what I heard from you uh, uh, and from the governor on the issue of the link between the SDGs, uh, what we've learned in the COVID-19 and the post-2030 agenda and saying that I agree with you that yes, there is a goal on goal 16 on creating peaceful and just societies, but that doesn't go far enough because it doesn't look at some of the issues that we are talking about. And there are still some years for the SDG and the goals and targets till 2030 to be achieved, but we have to think beyond and we have to think of how other elements such as the ones you are mentioning on the issue of nuclear disarmament, the abolition of nuclear weapons, a peace dividend, if that can be put into the use for sustainable development, how will that change things for the future? So let me start by congratulating you for thinking about these issues and to uh, somehow ensure that future iterations and consideration of what happens in the SDGs after 2030, we'll be able to concentrate on such important issues that you have mentioned. And I want to, of course, thank uh, Governor Yuzaki and the Hiroshima prefectural government for their continuous support to our work of UNITAR and many of the areas that we are going to be discussing today. I have visited Hiroshima several times and uh, it is always very moving experience when I visit Hiroshima, uh, which has witnessed devastation and tragedy uh, and shown what uh, war and destruction and humans can do to each other and what technology and the kind of impacts they can have. But it gives, Hiroshima is also a city of hope, uh, like the name of your organization, because it shows that this beautiful city has transformed itself from ashes to a modern, beautiful, sustainable global center of peace. And I'm encouraged with the lessons learned, and I think it's very appropriate that it's you and the governor who are leading this charge for bringing these considerations into future iterations of the SDGs. I'm also inspired a lot by the efforts of the citizens of Hiroshima, people like you and the governor, who are doing in the tireless efforts to eliminate nuclear weapons, uh, particularly also the Hibakusha and the amount of work they have done in bringing this awareness to the world. Nuclear weapons posed an existential threat to humanity. We all know that. The consequences of the use of nuclear weapons 
of stumbling into a nuclear war or accident are going to be catastrophic. We need to make every effort to promote nuclear disarmament and non-proliferation and the abolishment, nothing short of complete abolishment of nuclear weapons. Of course, SDGs and the relationship with nuclear disarmament and non-proliferation are very deep. The SDGs are a pathway for us to grow in a way that fully considers long-term economic, social, and environmental dimensions of issues, as well as the need to create peaceful and just societies. And we face many risks. You've highlighted the risk which suddenly came upon us uh, 18 months ago in the form of COVID-19, which has affected everyone in the world and uh, has reversed, severely reversed, the progress we have made in the SDGs. We've seen, for example, an increase in extreme poverty. 150 million peoples globally have fallen back into extreme poverty. The economic, social, and environmental consequences have been horrendous. Hazards humanity face are of many types. We've seen this, uh, which is like uh, biological or uh, um, uh, uh, hazard, but we have natural hazards, earthquakes, volcanic eruptions. We have climatological hazards such as droughts and fires and floods, extreme weather, rising sea levels. We have biological hazards like Ebola and COVID-19. And of course, we have the misuse of technology, um, including often in things like nuclear accidents or the use, potential use of weapons by design or accident. It is always silly to think of responding only after these damage has been done. It is time consuming, it's expensive, and many of the consequences are irreversible. The key principle in all risk management is to minimize or eliminate possible exposure to hazards. Prevention is the best policy. In the environmental domain, it is often referred to as a precautionary principle. Detonating nuclear weapons will have disastrous consequences and will affect all the SDGs from health to environmental degradation. Considering these close links between all the SDGs and risk, it is high time that communities of practitioners from various sectors come together, think out of the box and start collaborating to minimize and eliminate this particular hazard. And um, so I end by endorsing your mission, by saying that we will be there to help you along in this mission. And we hope we see a future uh, form and iteration of the SDGs, which will incorporate your concerns. I thank you very much, uh, Shimada-san. Thank you, Mr. Seth, for your very encouraging comments and statements. And that also like can help us uh, open our eyes and uh, try to like uh, construct the ways of working uh, towards the uh, foreseeable future without the nuclear weapons. But also we should also address the uh, sustainable development goals. Uh, including the uh, how we can just uh, el I mean, the, eradicate uh, the uh, poverty and uh, and so on. So uh, now I would like to move on to turn the uh, uh, give the floor to Dr. Douglas Show. Uh, he's from the NTI, and uh, I would like him to touch upon the, some nuclear disarmament issues. So uh, Dr. Shao, uh, you have the floor, sir. Thank you so much. Uh, Mr. Shimada, I'm very grateful to you and to the other organizers and the and Hiroshima uh, for Global Peace uh, for organizing this session, but also for your extraordinary vision and purpose in undertaking this work. I'm just going to go ahead and share my screen. And uh, okay, are you seeing that? So uh, just let me know if you if you don't see it. Um, I am here on behalf of the Nuclear Threat Initiative. I'm a consultant to the Nuclear Threat Initiative, uh, which is an organization that in its mission and activities unites uh, the questions of uh, pandemic health and nuclear weapons particularly. Uh, the Nuclear uh, Threat Initiative is focused on practical work to combat nuclear risks and uh, global biological health risks. And so it has identified these two existential threats as primary areas of focus where it will, in, it will conduct its programmatic work. It 
joins leaders like former Senate Armed Services Committee Chair from the United States, Senator Sam Nunn, and former U.S. Secretary of Energy, Ernie Moniz, who have been instrumental in, uh, in the formation and the uh, further development of U.S. nuclear weapons policy into a, uh, into a discussion about how to make that, uh, that policy less, less risky. And that conversation in 2008 led to a conclusion among uh, Senator Nunn, former Secretary of Defense Bill Perry, former Secretary of State George Shultz, uh, and um, uh, former Secretary of State Henry Kissinger, that relying on nuclear weapons for security isn't sustainable and that uh, we need to find another way. The fact that nuclear weapons play an important role in, in uh, security considerations now is not something that we, we can depend on indefinitely, and we should undertake practical work to move in a new direction. And so that's what NTI does uh, in the nuclear weapons space, as well as in the biological uh, risks space through a, an action model that includes uh, the development of actionable solutions, so generating ideas for practical change, catalytic action that demonstrates uh, the viability of these I of the application of these ideas to governments, global engagement, working with governments around the world and international organizations to uh, to develop uh, programs that implement these ideas, ultimately focus towards systemic change to make the world safe from preventable global catastrophe by focusing on nuclear and biological threats that imperil humanity. So the, uh, that brings me to a, to a second observation about um, uh, the, the connection between nuclear weapons and the sustainable development goals. We have seen the, the almost incalculable human tragedy that results from the use of just two nuclear weapons. But today, the combined global arsenals number something around 13,500 nuclear weapons, which um, if used, if even a small fraction of that arsenal was used, it would have catastrophic impacts on, uh, on the world population, the human population, but obviously on any efforts to achieve the sustainable development goals. And, and uh, as in any global shock, many of the most uh, uh, underserved and, uh, and, and people who are living in the most precarious position, uh, situations would suffer the most. And in this context of 13,500 nuclear weapons worldwide, the guardrails constructed against their use during the Cold War and subsequently are increasingly failing. There was an important success earlier this year in the extension of the New START Treaty, uh, and uh, there are ongoing discussions, but many other structural uh, guardrails against the use of nuclear weapons have failed. And so uh, it's, uh, it's incumbent on humanity to address this problem very assertively and to find that bridge between nuclear disarmament and the sustainable development goals. M many of the world's uh, governments have expressed their desire for a world free of nuclear weapons through the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. Uh, the nuclear weapon states are taking another path, uh, but everyone needs to uh, work together uh, toward the achievement of uh, a world free of nuclear weapons and the avoidance of nuclear weapons use. And that is an, an essential element of the mission of the Nuclear Threat Initiative and why we're so excited to partner with Hiroshima for Global Peace in the Cranes for Our Future campaign, particularly because uh, we know that the Nuclear Threat Initiative does work to create knowledge that helps move us practically in terms of specific programmatic activity 
to a reduced reliance on nuclear weapons, better verification, better safeguards monitoring of non-proliferation obligations, better communication among and between governments to reduce the risk of nuclear weapons use. We know now that this is not an insoluble problem. We can imagine, we can design, and to a large measure, we can describe what a global system for the technical monitoring of nuclear technology would look like. We don't have all the details in hand, but we have, uh, there, are, there are identifiable steps that we could take today that would make the world safer against nuclear weapons use. But the political will is not present. Uh, governments of the world are not engaged in the way they would need to be to achieve this outcome. And that's why it needs to be a global human effort. And so this, uh, the, the uh, opportunity to work with Hiroshima for Global Peace to join leaders, cultural influencers, and families around the world in envisioning a nuclear-free world is very exciting for us. And it's a, it's a simple uh, step that we're, we're undertaking through the participation in the Cranes for Our Future campaign. We're asking people around the world to fold a paper crane and share that paper crane on social media with your wishes for a brighter future. And this, this practice of folding paper cranes in recognition of the horror of the bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki was uh, initiated by a girl named Sadako Sasaki, who was a victim of the atomic bombings and who died from, from uh, illness that was, uh, that was uh, caused by those bombings. But she created this, uh, this symbol of a paper crane as a vehicle for uh, imagining a better future of peace and international cooperation. And this campaign is going to, it, it, it's beginning now. I understand the, the website just went live today. And you'll see that down below at www.cranesforourfuture.org. Uh, the, cam the campaign is, has kicked off, but it will culminate in the sharing on social media of images of your cranes in, on the peace weekend of August 6th to 9th uh, this year which will be the 76th anniversary of the atomic bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And uh, it is through this vehicle we hope to raise uh, the awareness of people around the world to the problem that nuclear weapons pose, that this is not something that we can live with forever indefinitely, as everyone from peace activists to uh, hardened cold warriors like Henry Kissinger and George, George Shultz have, uh, have discovered, we can't rely on nuclear weapons for security forever. It is unsustainable. And it is connected to the sustainable development goals because the use of nuclear weapons would make the achievement of those goals impossible. And so we're uh, grateful uh, to anyone who will join us in folding a paper crane and sharing it on the Peace Weekend in order to raise awareness and, uh, and generate toward political will to, uh, to uh, work towards a world free of nuclear weapons. And that's all. Thank you, Dr. Show, uh, for your eye-opening uh the presentations and also like a thank you very much uh, for introducing the the campaign the cranes for a future because the nti and also the hope have been working uh the quite like a heart to uh make this campaign on make, make it on time like for this event and of course i mean the good news is that today is a launching day of this campaign so uh, as the uh, doctor's show like already like uh, shared the uh, the website and also like you know if you look at the chat box uh, you can just look at the at the uh, the site of the cranes for a future 
So uh, please also join us, like you know, fold in the paper crane and also like a uh, post it on the SNS uh, with the hashtag cranes are a future. And if you say like you, if you haven't uh, folded the paper crane before, this is the greatest opportunity for you to start. Like also make that this beautiful like a uh, paper cranes uh, and also like you know, with your hope for the, uh, fu for the peace uh, for the future. So please join to this campaign and today's a starting day. And of course, as the uh, doctor show said, the August 6th until this August 9th, uh, we just set at the, uh, the peace weekend. Uh, we can also like uh, have the massive campaign, uh, you know, the praying for the, fu for, for the future peace. So in that sense, uh, the, now I would like to uh, turn to the, the third uh, panelist. Uh, it is the uh, Ms. Vanda Proskova. Uh, she's also like a sharing her views uh, from the youth perspectives. But the, I've been always, uh, you know, the quite surprised like uh, how many, like, you know, the quite like uh, various kinds of the activities uh, she's been, uh, you know, the working on. So like, and I'm really looking forward to uh, hearing her presentation. So uh, Vanda, now you have the floor. Uh, thank you so much. Hello, everyone. It's so good to be here. Um, do you share uh, see my screen? Um, perfect. Just on the crane making, I can highly recommend that activity. I am not very good at it, but I do enjoy it. So anyone in the audience, um, absolutely give that a try. Um, hello, everyone again. My name is Vanda. I'm an internet uh, student of international law. I'm one of the two coordinators of Youth Fusion, which is also known as the Abolition 2000 Youth Network, and I'm the vice chair at Prague Vision Institute for Sustainable Security. And today I'd like to highlight the three points, but to sort of look at them from the from a young person's person's perspective to give you an, an idea about how we're thinking about these issues among um, the different youth groups. Um, involved in nuclear disarmament. So obviously, um, one of the biggest topics of today's session is, of course, the pandemic. Um, this global health crisis came, as you all know, out of nowhere. And within just a couple of weeks, it completely changed all of our lives. We were completely unprepared for this. People were crowded in supermarkets just to get, you know, toilet paper and, and, and other, other necessities. Um, and it took us a while to adapt to this, the, to this new standard and to start cooperating globally. And only through the global cooperation, we are now slowly, slowly coming out of this crisis. So now to bridge it to nuclear weapons, um, let's imagine just a small regional nuclear conflict. For example, one between India and Pakistan. So a, a small geographical location. Um, but um, even that would completely turn our lives upside down within minutes with no spare time to prepare for these changes. Apart from the millions of, of deaths, uh, the world would face massive starvation as the farm groups, for example, or the waters in the surrounding areas would become contaminated. Um, radioactive contamination of the countries involved in the conflict, but also in neighboring countries because as COVID, um, radioactivity does, doesn't recognize borders. So there would be massive famine and it would really have a truly global uh, climate effect as well due to the dust and smoke known as nuclear winter. So you can see the impact here would be much worse and we would have much less time to adjust and to prepare to such crises. So that's one bridge. And the second bridge uh, on, a, on a slightly happier, happier note is that I think the pandemic has actually made it slightly easier for us to imagine these terrific scenarios. And it's helped us to realize the need of a shift from military security to human security, really focused on the needs of an individual or community, on our health and on our well being. Um, so there is silver linings. Of course, this isn't, this isn't revolutionary, this isn't breaking news. Already in 1948, the world has read for the first time the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, and specifically um, Article 3, which reads that everyone has the right to life, liberty, and security of person. Uh, so you probably see where I'm going with this. Uh, well, in 2018, the UN Human Rights Committee made it very clear what this means in terms of nuclear weapons, specifically in the comments number 36, 
uh, which stated that the threat or use of nuclear weapons would amount to a crime under international law. And this reasoning sort of goes hand in hand with the um, ICJ's advisory opinion on the threat or use of nuclear weapons from 1996, which in short um, said that the threat or use of those weapons uh, would violate the principles and rules of humanitarian law and law of armed conflicts and specifically in terms of humanitarian law. So their use would violate the principle of discrimination. It would do severe damage to the environment. It would cause an unnecessary suffering uh, to the soldiers and civilians and so on. So we do recognize that the threat or use of nuclear weapons would not only be incredibly unethical but it would also be violating humanitarian and international law. And I just wanted to note, note here, it's five minutes really isn't a lot as much, but um, uh, specifically here in, in the Western world, we, we often talk about human rights and, and the law aspects, but we often neglect the impacts that nuclear weapons and specifically their testing has had on, on local or Aboriginal peoples in, in the areas of testing. So. You know, to this day, there, there are nuclear weapon immigrants who cannot return to their homes because those lands remain inhabitable. Um, so that should not be forget, forgotten as well. But I think that really more and more young people recognize these issues. And, and I know that because I, I do talk, talk to these young people and uh, we as a collective want to explore them further, which I think also here the unitary representatives could, could confirm. So to conclude on, on a slightly more positive note, um, we, at least at Youth Fusion and Prague Vision, remain positive. Um, the famous 2030 agenda has a really interesting motto to, to leave no one behind, not any single person, but also not any of the 17 SDGs. We all here know that we should really pay attention to all of them, as you can't really solve a climate change crisis, but forget about nuclear weapons or, or energy or, or equality. Um, and it's also interesting that the whole agenda was adopted by all member states, but its implementation is really up to all individuals, up to, up to all of us, which is why it's so fantastic to participate in events such as this one and mainly to see so many, so many participants in the, in the audience. Um, so that gives me one, one big thing to take away and that, that the civil society is really, really powerful. Um, and we've been all experiencing that in the, uh, always. Just last year, uh, the We the People's 2020 Coalition opened uh, for signatures a global appeal for a nuclear weapons free world, which now has over 1000 endorsements and it's still open. So if you would like to endorse, um, I would invite you to do so. I'll share the link to that in the chat later. Um, and uh, among other things, this appeal calls for abolition of nuclear weapons by 2045, which would be the 100th anniversary of the UN. Um, so that's some food for thought for, for looking into the future and going even beyond 2030. Um, and finally, um, I think it all comes back to education. So I agree with, with UNITAR's mission and, and I applaud it. Um, education of citizens, of, of youth. Um, and that's why I believe the, the, the last project that I want to share here with you, Nuclear Games, is, is fantastic. It's a new educational and innovative platform highlighting five stories of some threats and horrors that nuclear weapons and nuclear energy pose. And the project's here to educate people about, for example, the Cuban Missile Crisis or the Fukushima incident. So it, it is fun, but incredibly engaging. The platform will be launched on July the 23rd. Um, so if there is anyone interested in storytelling um, and nuclear weapons and nuclear energy, I'd highly recommend uh, you to, to check that out. So the moral of my presentation is, or what I would like it to be rather, is that there are silver, silver linings and that through actions of civil society and, and young people especially, we do have the power to make this world a, a better place. And I'll, I'll leave you with that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Vanda, uh, for a wonderful presentation and also the, the providers with the uh, various information uh, from the quite like you don't the the ranging from the human rights and the youth perspective and sustainability, New York uh, the new nuclear abolition and so on. So thank you very much for that. And uh, lastly, uh, another youth representative. And now I would like to give the floor to Mr. Kento Suzuki. You have the floor. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Uh, Shimada. 
So let me quickly try to share my screen. Um, give me just one second. Um, all right. So I'm going to turn it into uh, full screen. Uh, there we go. Okay. Are you guys seeing the screen all right? Yeah. Okay. Sounds good. Awesome. Well, um, hello, everyone. I am Kento Suzuki, and I'm a third year university student at uh, Brown University in the US. And first of all, it is my greatest pleasure and honor to be here and to have this amazing opportunity to discuss very critical issues with all of you here. So thank you so much for having me in the first place. And I'm also the leader of this um, local NPO in Hiroshima called the Personalization Project, where we aim to create a world where every single one of us is able to personalize and internalize things that are happening inside and out of our communities and countries. So, 172 million people are still affected by conflict globally each year. One in five people living in conflict-affected areas are suffering from mental health issues. On the other hand, 7.6 million people hit the streets, striking for climate action worldwide uh, during, the, during the 2019 global climate strike. In consequence, many of the global big powers are now stating very concrete long-term strategies to reduce carbon emissions, or to be exact, they have no choice but to do so. I will never forget what I heard during a tour of the UN headquarters two years ago. The tour guide told me at the end of the tour that every individual on this entire planet will be guaranteed with the minimum standards, standards of living if we could spare merely 12% of the current global military budget. And I was wondering, why isn't there a collective global voice to lift that 12%? And at the same time, why are the governments now suddenly stating that they will be reducing their carbon emissions by 80 or 90 or even more percent than the past? I'm sure that these two numbers are not always necessarily comparable with each other. And I also know that there are so many reasons behind this. But if you ask me, that is because for many normal people, and especially youth like myself, disarmament and nuclear disarmament is a matter of the others, not ourselves. So I'm sure that many of you would agree that the global COVID-19 pandemic has literally changed our lives in so many different ways. I myself got kicked out of my university dorm, many things that I planned that got canceled, and I'm not really sure what my future would be like. But having said that, what I'm concerned about the most is the fact that more and more people now have very scarce room in their minds to think about the others. Existing social inequalities and inequities have dramatically widened, and marginalization of minority groups and other underrepresented population has become even more obvious. This trend, I think, is also seen in the discussion of nuclear weapon possessions. Especially as a Hiroshima native, I cannot express my gratitude and pleasure enough about the enforcement of the nuclear weapon ban treaty. Even though there's no doubt that the treaty has been extremely successful in collecting international attention on the issue of nuclear weapon abolishment, I think there's still a huge gap between the nuclear weapon states and the non-nuclear weapon states. So now, what is the breakthrough on this? I launched a personalization project believing that it will be a breakthrough in resolving literally any social issues in the world. Through the personalization project, we provide Japanese youth with opportunities to interact with the counterparts in other countries and get to know about them, their life, their custom, and their perspectives, so that when they come across news about the other countries, they can feel personal attachment and therefore naturally become interested in what is happening in the world. This will enable our participants to personalize the matters of their own communities and countries, as well as those of the other communities and countries. As a part of the personalization project, we recently had a session where we conducted a session where we invited a group of local youth from the Gaza district to describe the historical context of the current ongoing uh, conflict, as well as their personal stories. And one of the Japanese participants asked them what she, as a Japanese youth, can do about it. In response, the Palestinian speakers repeatedly asked us to first of all personalize what is happening in Palestine and then spread our thoughts and words to our surroundings and to the world and stated that that would be the greatest reward for them. In another session we, where we connected local high school in Hiroshima and another school in Kabul, the African peoples were so touched by the powerful speech that the Hiroshima students made about the Hiroshima A-bombing and they later contacted us directly that they started watching many documentaries and films to learn more about the incident in its aftermath. I'm sure that those people are now spreading their words and thoughts to their own surroundings as well. So all in all, 
My role in this journey of achieving SDGs and nuclear disarmament is to continue planting these seeds, these seeds of personalization in the minds of global youth. In 2045, for example, I'll be 45, and, you know, and it will mark the 100th anniversary of the end of the biggest global war that we've ever, we, that we've ever experienced. And of course, the establishment of the UN as well. By then, uh, many of the World War II survivors that literally embody the war experience themselves will no, will no longer be there. But however, I'm sure that these seeds of personalization that we're planting now will then grow into beautiful flowers of personalization. And those flowers will then bring us to a world where SDGs and nuclear disarmament are fully achieved. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Suzuki, uh, for your very encouraging presentation. And uh, I also do believe the personalization uh, is the key uh, for internalized and also like we just feel it uh, to our heart uh, when we just uh, work on something uh, like the nuclear disarmament and it's a global cause. Thank you very much for sharing that view. And also thank you for planting the seeds uh, for the future. So I would like to like, you know, to ask you uh, the later, like, you know, the, in the free discussions, uh, touch upon the personalization like uh, activities and also the what could be the uh, key elements uh, to um, uh, move forward uh, for the personalization. So yes. with that, uh, we would like to turn to the session two, which is uh, titled the free discussions. But before doing that, I acknowledge the three discuss uh, three questions are coming. So here, like, you know, the if you have the question, specific questions uh, to a certain uh, speaker or the panelists, please address the, the to to who to whom you address that question. And so that I think uh, uh, the each panelist can just send uh, the comment upon uh, on your questions. But before just opening the floor for that one, uh, let me just, you know, use in my like, you know, this special the position as the moderator, uh, can we just, you know, to take the one of the key questions raised by the Vanda, which is a very like a vague, but also super important question. And I would like to ask your opinions that the, for this very basic question, this, uh, can we get rid of the nuclear weapons by 2045? I think this is a very important question, but it's a quite difficult to answer. So if, any of you among the uh, panelists can address in that way, especially like at the, on that question, uh, and also share your views and opinions. And if you have any suggestions, how we can achieve that goal, uh, now is the time to shout. So um, who takes the first one? While you're thinking, because you know the, since uh, this is one of the key goals, what the hope is aiming for, try to bridge the uh, gaps between nuclear disarmament and also the uh, sustainability, especially for the sustainable development goals post 2030 until let's say year 2045, which the Vanda and the Mr. Suzuki both like, uh, addressed. So uh, how we can just do that? Uh, can we eliminate nuclear weapons by 2045? Uh, means actually whether we can include such uh, challenging goals uh, in the post-2030 SDGs. So uh, if we do that, how? So if you can just share, this is a kind of open questions, but if you can just address in that way, uh, I would really appreciate as a kind of opener uh, for the free discussion. So, I might give it a give it a give it a start. Just from the civil society's perspective, I think we do have a chance, but we need to start act soon. I meaning raising awareness, really connecting the issue of nuclear weapons to the SDGs, but to, to the broader sustainable development fields. So, for example, tackling it through um, the su sustainability and, and um, climate aspect has been has been really. Has been really helpful and really to, to, to make a global rallying call and to push on, on all the governments um, whether it is and we do have a range of tools to do that whether it is the tpnw whether it is another another tool um, but but i do I'm, I'm an optimist so i would say that we do have a chance 
And technically to actually like get rid of them, that is that is perfectly doable in 25 years. So I don't see why, why not. <laughs> Thank you, Vanda, uh, to answering that question and also sharing your views. I also believe that uh, this is uh, feasible and this is possible to eliminate nuclear weapons within 25 years. And especially I put the great emphasis and opinions and the views from the youth because you are the uh, next generations who live in the 2045 as one of the uh, key players uh, who can just also they make their dreams come true. So uh, other views uh, from the, oh let, yes, uh, Mr. Let, Seth, please do. Uh, let, let me have a bash at that rather difficult question. But first, let me say how refreshing it is to hear the views of young people like Wanda and uh, Suzuki-san because it gives me hope. And, uh, you know, when we were in negotiating the SDGs and I had a ringside seat in that process, many people said that this SDG agenda is going to be impossible. Do you think we can ever eliminate poverty by 2030? Do you think we can provide health for all by 2030? Do you think we can provide energy for all by 2030? Do you think we can eliminate hunger by 2030? So there were a lot of skeptics out there who said that it's not going to be possible. But idealism and ambition is the starting point for any mission. Uh, we cannot start in a pessimistic note by saying this is not doable. And it's like that in this nuclear disarmament field. The tragedy is that many of our strategic thinkers, many of our political leaders continue to believe that nuclear weapons are a form of security but it's actually making security worse rather than security of our world even better. So we need a dramatic change in strategic thinking, political thinking, political leadership to reach that ambition and to get ourselves to a nuclear weapon free world by 2045. Of course it's doable. And I think that ambition must be enshrined in whatever we are going to do, especially in the post 2030 context. So I am optimistic. And all these young people today in uh, 25 years from now will be occupying positions of influence. They will no longer be very young people though, but I hope they will carry their idealism and ambition to make this a reality for humanity. I just uh, jump in to observe that there's a lot we don't know about what a world without nuclear weapons, but knowledge of nuclear weapons looks like. Uh, but we know more than we're, than we, we, we know more about that world than we have deployed. There are solutions that we have in hand that we have not yet deployed uh, to move us in that direction. And I think there's, I mean, we could get a lot done uh, very promptly with the political will to drive in that direction. And then we'll know more and, uh, and the path will be more clear forward. Thank you, Mr. Seth. And thank you, uh, Dr. Shao, uh, to sharing your views. Well, then, then let me ask you some kind of challenging questions. So how, uh, what could be the possible barriers or challenges uh, to include a nuclear uh, kind of a nuclear abolitions and disarmament in the post-2030 uh, SDGs, as well as also, uh, do you have any ideas how to involve the nuclear armed states in uh, uh, kind of initiatives and activities aiming for realizing nuclear free world? Anyone? Uh, Mr. Seth, please. I know the UN well. I know the General Assembly. I was in New York 25 years. And the biggest barrier is really going to be that there is a great divide between issues of the consideration of issues of peace and security and the issues of sustainable development, human rights, in the consideration of these issues by the political leadership in the United Nations. How to break that wall? It is, there should not be that wall between issues of peace and security, human rights and sustainable development, they're all so closely intertwined. 
but that's going to be one big challenge as you consider moving this agenda forward and enmeshing it in the agenda on sustainable development and human rights. Diplomats who are in the General Assembly and those who consider these issues will argue that, look, it's the Security Council that takes care of these issues, or it's the disarmament apparatus which takes care of these issues, including in Geneva. You can't mix these two, but we've got to break that wall and force uh, this logic of and convince um, that community that you have to think a little differently to make this change. So I think the first stumbling block is going to be that divide which exists in the United Nations in New York. Exactly. That's what I also found. Um, any other views uh, regarding this uh, challenge and questions? Uh, Vanda, please. Uh, thank you. Um, so two, two points to this. First, one of the barriers I, I see are the huge corporations that are profiting from nuclear weapons, which are, of course, lobbying the governments. Um, so the answer to that could be our support of nuclear divestment. Um, there is a wonderful campaign doing precisely that called the Move the Nuclear Weapons Money, and it is highlighting all the ways we could be spending our money instead of nuclear weapons. So the whole idea that we're wasting uh, one trillion USD per decade on nuclear weapons, and then what could that cover? Um, and that's been that's so interesting to me, and it's interesting to young people especially because then we can have debates around how, how many seconds of nuclear weapon spending would cover your student debt, and 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 those conversations, or or how many wells we could build, or how many hospitals, and we'd still have so much money left. Um, so nuclear divestment as one of the answers, and um, how to engage um, nuclear armed states was the, I think the second part of the question. And there, I believe that really engaging them and supporting incremental measures could be a way to do that. So, and again, I'll, um, a wonderful initiative that it will be launched soon, um, No First Jews Global, which is supporting clearly um, No First Jews um, in nuclear open states and building support for, 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 the, for those policies in, in nuclear allied states. Um, so building building dialogues among, among all. Um, so I'll, I'll post the links into, into the chat. Thanks. Thank you very much, Vanda, for sharing the opinion. I just recognize like you know, that during the chat bot, uh, there are a few questions asked, but they, if you have any specific questions, please do that using the Q&A uh, box instead of the, uh, the comments, because the chat, chat section is a kind of a quite, uh, you know, it becomes really crowded. And it's a, sometimes it's a quite difficult for the speakers and panelists to follow. So if you have any questions, please just use the Q&A. And if you do have a general comment, you can just do that uh, through the chat box. So that's one thing I would like to say. And are there any further views or responses to these uh, challenging questions? Well, I'd just like to amplify for a moment uh, the No First Use Global Campaign because it raises some very interesting possibilities. Uh, many states that, um, as a matter of their security policy, rely on nuclear deterrence uh, extended by the United States, uh, that's not something that's, that's uh, a, 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 does not seem to me to always be a fully coordinated position of the polity. Right. It's something that the government does um, without tight supervision of the electorate in some cases. And so widening those conversations, I think, would be especially illuminative of the issue. What what is a government's relationship to nuclear weapons? And is that aligned with the views of the population that it governs? Thank you very much for providing us with that point. And uh, I just recognize there's a one specific question uh, asking to Mrs. Suzuki. And I hope that this is uh, relevant to the discussions. It says, uh, how can Africa leverage a nuclear energy as a source of electricity? Do you think it's clean source of energy? Uh, if you are able to uh, 
willing to like address on that point, please do so. Otherwise, I mean, you can always, I mean, I also invite you to answer to the questions uh, that I just, you know, depose to the all like a panelists. So, Mr. Suzuki, are you ready to take the floor? Yeah, thank you so much, Mr. Ashimara. Um, so, first of all, I need to apologize. I'm not any of an expert um, on nuclear energy and um, energy production. Um, so, I'm not fully sure uh, the extent to which I can respond to this specific question. But having said that, as um, you know, uh, as uh, Vanda mentioned, I think divestment is definitely one key way of trying to leverage on nuclear energy. I mean, obviously, everyone knows there's so many different alternative ways of producing energy. Um, and so yeah, divestment definitely is um, possibly be a solution to that. Um, I'm not really sure um, the extent to which that is currently possible at the moment in Africa and in many African countries. And if I may, uh, if I could possibly respond to the very first question that Mr. Shimada, you asked, uh, whether or not uh, we were able to eliminate nuclear weapons by 2030 or for that matter, 2045. Um, it might sound pretty cliche, but I would say that it's not a question of like uh, capability, whether or not we are able to um, do that. We definitely must do that no matter what. That's kind of the stance that we definitely need to have always, right? But having said that uh, more concretely, um, in resolving, in achieving nuclear disarmament, for that matter, for solving any other issues in the world, I think what I would like to call as quality and quantity, um, I think it really boils down to those two, right? So in terms of quality, that's exactly what you guys are doing. Especially, you know, Mr. Shaw, uh, the work of NTI and uh, coming up with um, practical solutions and um, the very um, effective um, and best route to the, um, you know, uh, resolution of, of nuclear disarmament, um, very strategic um, ways and practical ways to do that. Um, in terms of like uh, food, food to mobilize, uh, what kind of resources to use and so on and so forth, that's a quality. And in terms of quantity, that's exactly what we as a personalization project do where we um, trying to nurture um, young minds, young bright minds that are first of all being interested in those social issues, including nuclear disarmament um, and being able to personalize those issues. And of course also, um, you know, uh, being able to, to to utilize and motivated enough to utilize those quality works that you guys have been doing so far to try to utilize those strategies that you guys are putting out there, right? So I think if we truly orchestrate our works of both quality and quantity fully 100%, um, I think it is definitely possible to um, eliminate um, nuclear uh, weapons totally, if not in 2030, um, in 2045, so... Fantastic. Thank you very much, Mr. Suzuki, uh, for your answer. Um, there is also like another uh, quite interesting question uh, from the uh, participants. It says, like, how can we stop the flow of nuclear weapons from Earth to space? Um, that's also one of the issues because, you know, the even though the space related matters are not included in the current SDGs, if I understand correctly, but also there is some kind of expansion of our kind of exploration, exploration towards the space as kind of a source of the, for example, uh, anyway, future or energy or even like, you know, the another Earth. But anyway, um, with that one, actually, there's also some uh, tendency uh, can be observed that we just expand uh, nuclear things or even the weaponry uh, towards the uh, space out of space. So uh, if anybody uh, uh, among the panelists uh, can address on that point, uh, I would like to welcome your point, how we can just avoid or discourage the countries and states to uh, expand it towards the space, um, especially in the context of the nuclear weapons. So that's, uh, I would like to just, you know, to open the floor for uh, your comments uh, among the panelists. But if you're not willing or if you're not comfortable addressing that point, uh, that's okay. But yeah, I see that Vanda uh, is raising her hand. Vanda? Thank you. I just wanted to clarify because to my knowledge, the space was covered by a nuclear weapon free as a nuclear weapon free zone. So meaning that an expansion of nuclear weapons to space would be violating that treaty. So is that what the 
question was um, whether states are willing to violate that treaty, or I think I'm, I just wanted to clarify the, the, the viewpoint there. Exactly. That's also why we like to have a clarification, but also like a like a space, outer space. We also have some kind of a, a question or the problem of the uh, interpretation um, of the rules. So sometimes for the polar area, like you know the um, and so on. So uh, uh, for the uh, person uh, who have asked this question if you could clarify what exactly you are asking uh, to answer, uh, that will help us to address the, your issue. So are we yeah. waiting for an oral comment or might I interject something? Yeah, I just would like to like have the kind of clarification used in a QA and a session because that question is coming through the Q&A that can be only visible for the panelists and on the moderator but uh, I haven't received any, I guess. All right. Mm. Oh yeah, nuclear weapons designed in theory for mining. That's the, I think, to, uh, for water mining. Hmm? This is the, um, kind of some clarification coming uh, from in outer space. Hmm. To be honest, I can, I don't, I'm not aware. Yeah, asking QA session, thank you, Ayman. But anyway, uh, that's uh, some, uh, do an appraisal of what the UN has has not achieved until now. Da, 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 da. Okay, that's another question that coming uh, to us. So anyway, uh, yeah, it says nuclear weapons designed in theory for mining, for water mining in outer space. And I'm sorry to tell uh, I haven't, uh, I, I do not like, you know, get the quite uh, what exactly it is asking. So, uh, Okay, while well, we're waiting for the further clarification, um, can we just, you know, to move on to another question? <laughs> yeah. Now, yeah, please uh, do like a Mr. Seth, if you could address any Well, I, I just wanted to address several questions are being raised on the issue of nuclear energy. And of course we know there's so many contrarian views on nuclear energy. Some say it's green and clean, especially from the greenhouse gas emission standpoint. Others say that the safety issues, the risk of uh, uh, you know, uh, proliferation and the risk of, and the dangers in the disposal of nuclear waste, those make it so complicated. Uh, but I've also been reading that there's a lot of work going on not so much on nuclear fission, but on nuclear fusion. And if we do have a technologies which we can have controlled nuclear fusion in the future, that might provide some answer to this question because none of these questions is satisfactorily answered. We've seen enough nuclear accidents to know that nuclear energy is not necessarily safe. We also know that uh, uh, you know, the risks of uh, the waste and how it is managed is a big, big problem, especially for the poorer countries who have these capacities. So I think the jury is still out on this question and no one can give a very definitive and convincing answer to whether nuclear energy as it's presently being generated is clean and green. It's only with time and the development of new technologies that we'll be able to answer that question. Thank you, Mr. Seth, to touch upon that issue. And I recognize that Dr. Xiao, you would like to also take the floor. Please do. Yeah, I'd just like to observe that um, technology changes and, uh, and the interpretation of treaties change. New technologies are developed. They are used and misused in novel ways. I mean, this was the original purpose of arms control, nuclear arms control, was to try to get a grip on technological change and prevent it from creating destabilizing circumstances 
within the existing deterrent relationship. Uh, so these, these uh, sort of disruptive technologies of various kinds uh, are things that we will need to actively manage and treaties come and go. I mean, we've seen this in the nuclear weapons space uh, very vividly lately, but uh, I'd also hold out hope for the use of space for nuclear disarmament. We have the ability to monitor through space-based observation, mining of publicly available information, and machine learning capabilities for identifying nuclear activities and verifying that they are what they're claimed to be uh, that we couldn't have imagined 10 years ago. Thank you very much, Dr. Uh, Xiao, uh, to sharing your views. And of course, I mean, once we start to talk about the nuclear energy, and so when we talk about the nuclear weapons, of course, there is a direct link and also indirect link as well. And uh, in for the sake of, for example, dual use or so on and so on. But the, of course, the if I understand correctly, the end of the SDGs, there's also uh, some of the goals of talking about the sustainable access to the energy and so on. Whether, and the question is whether the nuclear uh, energy um, will provide this uh, sustainability or sustainable access to the energy to all. That's also the huge question to be asked. But anyway, if we talk about like a nuclear weapon, the nuclear disarmament and sustainability, uh, that question cannot be avoided. Anyway, um, then, uh, yes. I'm a bit like a confused by the uh, questions box, <laughs> but anyway, um, that's one thing is, uh, let me just ask one question specifically, um, you know, even though the, the Turkey sound like it is said, the young people are the future, definitely I agree with that. And uh, let me just address the question of the, whether it is possible to uh, eliminate or abolish the nuclear weapons by 2030 or 2045 question. And of course, there is a huge chunk of like opinions that the people would say nuclear weapons have served as a kind of deterrence of war. And uh, how we can just say like, you know, the uh, how we can just achieve the world without nuclear and also how we can just have the. Um, well, how I can say like, you know, the, the world without the nuclear weapons uh, be a safer place or how we can just, you know, the avoid the prevent us fr uh, from going to the war. Uh, you know, the if we can use that uh, kind of things, if you do have the, any kind of opinions, uh, that would be great. Uh, I hope uh, my question is clear enough, even though I'm a little bit confused. So just double checking, but are you asking whether or not we're able to um, create a world, create a safe world without um, nuclear weapons? Like even if we do not have nuclear weapons, is that, is that, is that what we're asking? Or? How we can provide the deterrence effect uh, without the nuclear weapons? Because uh, there is always a huge opinion coming from the nuclear armed states that the nuclear weapons have served as a deterrence effect, uh, you know, that we're not going to the war because of the existence of nuclear weapons, which I don't like, by the way, I mean, to be honest, but the actually, there's always a very strong opinion say, like, you know, the thing to the existence of the nuclear weapons, uh, we could prevent the countries uh, from going to the war or a nuclear war or something like that because of the fear or deterrence. So uh, how we can, achieve the world without nuclear weapons while securing the deterrence effect uh, for the peace and security. I think the 
bigger question is whether we want to continue using deterrence as a as a policy of a state rather than what what new weapon can we come up with when, when we don't have nuclear weapons anymore um and some some arguments claim that you know deterrence is it's just a theory it's not really proven um we don't want to dare if it works why we, we don't want to find out um so i'd be more for looking for ways of a more of a global cooperation rather than testing you testing deterrence with a with a with another weapon or, or, or something along those lines thank you vanda for addressing that question because it was not very clear from myself but actually uh, i completely agree with you and deterrence is just a theory and that's what i also found uh while i was working but anyway uh any other views regarding that because uh, the reason why i ask this question is that's also another issue uh, that the hope uh, seems to work on at the uh, at the at, at the in the other tracks uh, more like a research oriented one because they also would like to say uh what can we just you know do down uh how we can just uh, replace a system uh rel the, the world relying on the nuclear weapons for deterrence effect to completely change the world like you know we don't have we don't have to rely upon the nuclear but the actual while securing the deterrence or even the deterrence or is a kind of theoretical things but anyway uh that that was the reason why i asked this question because i don't know the answer yes vanda <laughs> um sorry it's just came came back to me now it's also another another whole question about what we view as security and that's something that i've touched upon in my presentation you know, I think COVID also highlighted the need of a change from military security, focusing around sovereign states, to, to human security, focusing around individuals and their needs, and again, well-being, healthcare, and all of that. So if, if we shift the way we think about security, we won't, we won't need deterrence, and it, it won't even be a question in the first place. And I think that we can all agree that nuclear weapons will not make an individual safer. It just won't it's posing a direct threat on the even on the individual so i think that could also help in answering that question definitely yes and uh, mr seth and uh, followed by the dr shao mr seth yes the ethical and the strategic discussions around the types of things we are discussing we don't have very much time to discuss them but i wanted to mention that even before 1945 the scientists who were involved in the Los Alamos project, for example, they grappled with these issues on the ethics and on the deterrence dimension, the strategic dimension. And it is something which the whole disarmament community has been looking at since then. So it's not as if uh, in the few minutes left, we'll be able to uh, resolve this. But I think uh, our ambition should be that there should be an iterative process for humanity, which winds this down. And the way to wind it down may not be by a complete abolition tomorrow, but till we can and all the communities involved who see the foolishness of using this as an argument for continuing with the status quo, till we can convince them otherwise, we'll be stuck with the situation. So I think an iterative process, which involving young people, involving industry, in, uh, of um, you know, stripping off the arguments of lobbyists and so on, it's only then that we'll get to an iterative process of getting to smaller and smaller and smaller arsenals till one day, hopefully we will see a world without nuclear weapons. I think that's how we'll have to approach it. That's beautiful. Thank you, Mr. Shao. Seth, and uh, can I hear from the Dr. Shao? You have the floor, sir. Thank you. So I, I just wanted to, to um, observe the difficulty in replacing one weapon system with another in support of a theory that is there is no single shared explicit nuclear deterrence theory. In fact, if you examine nuclear deterrence theory with any uh, effort, you'll find it under theorized uh, indeterminate, inconsistent, and outdated. And so the problems that would uh, be associated with a transition from one type of weapon to another in upholding it, uh, we're already experiencing those problems now. We're just not recognizing them. Thank you very much, Dr. Shao. And uh, are there any views uh, for... 
to, to these questions. Or if you would like to address something else, uh, now is the time to shout because we only have a five minutes to 10 minutes to go. So uh, I would like to hear from the panelists uh, for some additional comments. Of course, I mean, if you touch upon uh, your initiatives, like for example, the uh, nuclear games uh, by, by Banda, also like a personalization, uh, personalization uh, kind of a initiative that done by the Mrs. Suzuki. Of course, uh, if others would like to just, you know, the, introduce uh, some of the uh, related activities, and now is the time to shout. Suzuki-san. Yeah, um, so I have a quick comment on the last question that we have been discussing and um, a question to actually all of you, the panelists. Um, so a very quick comment to the last question that we were talking about. Um, it's going to be pretty vague in general, I know, but uh, I think the most uh, important point is the fact that even if there were to be anything called deterrence, which I do not really believe in, I um, mean, even if there were to be anything called deterrence, I think what really matters is the fact that the possible damage that, that, that could be caused by, you know, util utilization of nuclear po um, nuclear weapons, way, 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 way outweighs uh, the the benefits of what determines if the, even if there were to be any, right? Um, and I think it's going to be again, it's going to be really generic and everything, but I think what really uh, is fundamental to this whole discussion of nuclear deterrence is is that is that um, there is huge, huge, huge um, skeptics and fear, right? between um, nuclear armed countries and even between <clears throat> um, among um, non-nuclear states as well, right? So if there were to be anything that we could possibly do to sort of lift that, sort of um, minimize that sort of fundamental skeptics and um, fear among different countries, I mean, I know it's, it's generic and that's where we are, you know, um, targeting, right? The personalization project is to um, uh, create and nurture friendships um, and, um, you know, uh, very personal interactions and attachments among uh, the youth and global citizens across the globe in every single corner of the world. And uh, as a part of the personalization project, uh, we have been doing what we call weekly sessions where uh, we literally conduct sessions between Japanese youth and their counterparts in other countries every single week since last November. And we basically change our country every two months, right? So we've been conducting sessions between Japan and uh, Rwanda, uh, Guatemala, Germany, so on and so forth. And now we um, are conducting sessions with um, Indonesia. Um, having said that, uh, the first half, of the, first half of the second month, uh, we do um, a lot of topics concerning like everyday life, for example, like what we, what we eat for breakfast this morning, that kind of stuff like that, um, in order to make sort of foundation, foundation for being able to personalize things. And now that we have foundational ability to, to personalize things, uh, we then move on to the second half, which is to uh, talk more about tangible and actual um, you know, social issues, including nuclear disarmament. So I was wondering, um, as experts and um, civil activists, activists of nuclear you know, um, abolishment, um, I was wondering if you guys could possibly give us an advice on what we could possibly do in the second half of the session where we have a lot of youth, right? Middle schoolers and high schoolers from all over the world to discuss um, and interact and grapple with the uh, question and issue of nuclear um, deterrence and nuclear um, abolishment. So if there were to be any sort of suggestion on what we could possibly do and also what you guys actually want us to do um, and um, tackle in the second half of the program, that would be absolutely brilliant if, you could, if I could possibly hear from some of you. Thank you, Mr. Suzuki. Uh, for providing us with additional comments. Now ending time is approaching, but still I would like to hear from the panelists. So I think uh, Mr. Seth is asking the floor. So Mr. Seth, please take the floor. I will be quick. You know, humanity has shown this proclivity for collecting, for doing collective suicide. And we've seen in the way we are treating climate change, the way we treat biological diversity and so on. But what will stop this? It's only younger people of the type we've seen in this, the climate process and how they have galvanized the world and their political leadership into taking concrete action. We need a revolution of people and people's ideas to make these things happen. So Suzuki-san, I would say that how you can capture the imagination of young people to do what all the people who've been struggling against climate change do. 
uh, that is the only answer. Otherwise, humanity will move on to this precipice and be waiting to jump over this precipice. The other thing, I've been seeing persistent questions on biological weapons. And uh, I would like to say that because of the context in which we're having a conversation today, Hiroshima, hope, um, and uh, the devastation suffered by Hiroshima, that's why our focus has been on nuclear. But much of this discussion would be equally relevant to biological and chemical weapons. In fact, all weapons of mass destruction, because they leave the same destruction, the same loss of life, the same ecological, economic, and social consequences. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Seth. Absolutely. I completely agree with you. And uh, Dr. Xiao and Vanda, uh, your final words. So who goes first? Dr. So, Xiao, uh, you have the floor. I'll just share very briefly uh, to Mr. Suzuki. It's, I, I think the most important thing that youth can do is not show undue deference to authority and, and let zombie ideas and hysteresis persist uh, with regard to policies that have been outdated by their own terms for a long time and just face no critique. Thank you. And Vanda, your final word. Thank you. Um, yeah, to also, to also answer, um, well, some fi final comment statements slash answers to the final question. Um, encourage all young people to, to educate themselves, specifically the topics of deterrence and nuclear weapons. They're not covered in, in, by, by most of universities in their international relations or global governance programs, which is tragic, truly. Um, so inform yourself and then don't be afraid to share that. Don't be afraid to share your, your opinions. Don't be afraid to write a letter to your governments. I know it sounds activisty. Uh, but um, that's a good thing. And just don't be, be allowed. That's, that's, that's the one thing that I can share. Um, really, just by talking to young people around the world every day, uh, I just must pass on to the, 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 the hopefulness in me um, because it's, it's, really, it's really inspiring. Um, and to all the, all the participants here, I'll again post the link to Nuclear Games in, in the chat. Um, because just watch the trailer. I, I promise that you won't be disappointed. It's, it's, it's a, for me at least, it's a really um, groundbreaking project. So um, I'd also, that's the final thing I'm, I'm gonna say, thank you for, for having me. It's been a pleasure. Uh, thank you for all the questions. Um, um, I've had a great evening with everyone. So thanks. Thank you, Vanda. And I think this is a perfect like a timing for us to end. Before doing that, let me just close the session uh, by sharing them something. And uh, uh, let me do that. What this one and hold like this. Come on. <laughs> and here's it. Uh, yeah. Let me do that. Actually, as I just mentioned at the opening, uh, the, we are at the hope it's aiming for uh, creating and establish a new special uh, issue group, so-called Nuclear Free Future Group. And I've already like, touched upon the two specific activities. So uh, if the, those of you who are participating in this session are interested in joining and also the work with us, uh, please sign up using a Google survey address below. And you can also use the QR code. And another thing is, as the Dr. Xiao already like, you know, the introduced, uh, we do also have a Koreans for Future campaign starting actually today. So uh, please also like a uh, join and also try to like, uh, fold a paper crane and share it along with others around the world, starting from today until August 9th. It's like an end of the uh, peace weekend. So uh, with that, uh, the, I also wish to uh, thank you very much and please join the journey by hope and summary of the today's discussions and uh, probably uh, the answers for some of your questions will be posted uh, on the uh, Hiroshima for Peace, which is a hope website. So please also visit and also follow us the, uh, on the activities, how the hope is uh, moving forward together with the global partners. And I also acknowledge that there are like uh, lots of questions coming and this, I have to apologize that we couldn't address all the questions, 
but the uh, with the kind of permission from the all the panelists, if they're willing to and uh, to address on some of the issues, we may uh, be able to share uh, their responses uh, through our website. With this, I would like to say uh, thank you all for participating uh, to the session. And uh, I wish you a wonderful uh, day uh, if you are in the New York. And uh, also, like uh, since uh, here in Japan, it's almost 4.30 a.m. So I also have to say those of who are participating from uh, Asia uh, have a great new day. And uh, for those who are in the United States or in the Northern America, uh, the, I wish you have a wonderful evening and also wonderful afternoon for, I think, wonderful night. Uh, for those who are coming uh, participating from Europe. So with that, thank you very much for participating and also uh, for active participation and the great uh, views and also questions. We learned a lot. So uh, the uh, this session is adjourned now. Thank you very much and uh, God bless you all. Bye-bye.